About a month ago, a dear friend of ours, Dan Bigger, uh, went home to heaven after a bout of cancer. And I, I hadn't really heard about it. I'm a long way away from uh, where I grew up and where the Bigger family lived. His obituary, I noticed, it accentuated his love for his family and his love for studying and teaching the Word of God. And it concluded with a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Away from the body and at home with the Lord. What a glorious truth that is. For my title, I relied on a, a similar verse by the same author uh, from Philippians 1.23, which says, To depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Yes, Dan Bigger is far better better. Um, It's true that Dan loved the Bible, but it wasn't always that way. He really wasn't raised in a home that took the Bible very seriously. And I happened to be at university where Dan was, and he had quite a reputation. He had a big, full beard, and uh, he was known to be able to handle his liquor. He could drink people under the table. That was kind of his reputation. And the Christian group there had been infiltrated by Unitarianism, and it really had been ruined. And so the group collapsed. And it was just about the time my brother-in-law, Bob, and, and uh, Joan Gale, and others decided to gather together and to begin a new Christian group, Brock Christian Fellowship. And uh, they were eager believers, I'll tell you. They loved the Lord. They loved the Word. They, they had a heart for the lost, and they wanted to share the gospel. And so we came up with a little idea. In an evening, we would use a little room in one of the uh, dorms, a, kind of an open face that had a glass wall. It was just a, a lounge area. And we would put up signs called Focus, and uh, my brother-in-law would write, a question that maybe an issue in uh, in the world, an issue that people were talking about, and the, the point was, if you've got any questions or hang-ups about the Bible, come on and let's let's discuss them. And we'd get some day-old donuts and coffee, and uh, we'd get some people come in to talk. And sometimes we'd be there till eleven or twelve or one or two, and uh, and and so it was a it was a very vigorous time, and we had some excellent opportunities to share the gospel. Well, Dan heard about focus, and he decided he'd come down and put these little Christians in their place. And uh, he thought he was pretty good at arguing the case against the Bible, and so he showed up. But he found out that these Christians weren't quite as simple as he thought they were. And I think he especially got his eye on Joan Gale. And he kind of liked her, and she was a very energetic. She loved the Lord, and she loved to share the gospel. And and uh, so he came week after week. He would come and sit and talk. And finally, one night, I'll never forget the scene. I think uh, this is over 50 years ago, I think. But <laughs> Joan was uh, was on her knees. Dan was sitting in a chair. She was on her knees, and she had the open Bible. And she said to him, Dan Bigger, you know enough to get saved. And she put her Bible into his lap. She said, you go up to your room, you start reading John chapter 1 and keep reading till you get saved. And so dutifully, he picked it up and he disappeared down the hall. And so we began praying for Dan. Well, it came past midnight and some of the folks said, he's gone to bed, he's not coming back. But a few stayed on, we prayed and we, we sought the, the work of the Spirit of God in Dan's heart. And I think it probably was close to two in the morning. Dan came walking down the hall and nobody had to ask him, are you saved? He had shaved off this big beard, like, like Paul making a vow at Sancria, like this is a new beginning for me. And his face glowed. And you know, this is something that marked Dan for the rest of his life. Some of the comments in the obituaries, they talk about this. His smile. It wasn't a silly grin. It was this contented, at peace smile that comes when you know the Lord is your Savior. And uh, uh, it was such a beautiful thing to see. Well, 
uh, Dan was, as they say, born running. The moment he got saved, Brock University became his mission field. It's a good thing he was in his senior year. I wonder if he would have graduated otherwise, because every time I saw him, he was sitting witnessing to somebody. And as the summer was coming on, he said to our little group, now listen, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of young people in the summer who congregate in a park right down in the center of the city, Montebello Park. And he said, we need to reach them with the gospel. And the Lord had given him a burden to uh, rent a house right on the town square, right on this park, to use it as a base of operation to reach these young people when we found somebody interested to bring them back, give them a cup of tea or something, and, and share the gospel with them and have Bible studies there and so on. And he found a, a house that was for rent right on, uh, right on the street, right across from the park. And he had faith to trust the Lord to provide the funds for the rental and so on. And sure enough, the Lord provided all the funds needed for that summer. Well, when we got the, um, <laughs> the building, it was in bad shape. I don't know who had lived in there before, but uh, there were black walls, purple walls. It was quite a mess. And we went to work, and we cleaned it up and painted it, and my mother-in-law donated a bunch of furniture and some other ladies, and we really made it quite nice and got some Bibles and Bible study courses and gospel tracts and so on. And what do you know? We came back the next morning and everything had been stolen out of the house. And Dan had the sneaking suspicion that it was our neighbors. Our back corner neighbors around the street were the Satan's Choice motorcycle gang. And uh, he was pretty sure that's who it was that had taken all the stuff. And so I remember we were all looking around at the sort of the the emptiness of it all. And he said, was anything left? And um, I think it was Marge in the back in the kitchen. She was looking in a cupboard and she said, yeah, there's, a, there's an iron back here that they didn't take. So he said, give it to me. And he said, Jabe, come with me. And so the two of us went around the corner and he knocked at the door. The door opened and the man who was the, the gang's uh, sort of uh, security man, policeman, so to say. Uh, he, he's just a huge guy with a big, full red beard. And um, he said, what do you want? And Dan said, well, we're your neighbors just around the corner here. And we understand you came visiting the other, the other night and we weren't home. And um, you missed this. And he handed him the iron. And if ever you saw a man holding a hot potato, that was it. He didn't know what to do with it. And he was sort of, uh, yeah, sort of a thing and closed the door. And we thought we'd lost the iron too. But the next morning when we came back, all the furniture was back in place. Now, subsequently, here's an interesting little aside. Um, but uh, one evening, there was a, a young man who was standing had a very high porch, one of these old houses with a very high porch. and There was a little garden and then the sidewalk, and we planted some flowers in the garden. And he was standing, leaning on the railing. And I'll never forget his arms uh, like this. And he was, and he was saying some very um, risque things to one of the young Christian ladies. And it was very embarrassing for her. And before anybody could do anything, there was uh, one of these Satan's Choice motorcycle gang members who happened to be walking along the sidewalk, and he heard what was going on. And he bounded up the stairs, and he came to this young man, and he closed his fist like this, and he swung it at that man's face, that young fellow's face, and <clears throat> knocked him all the way over the railing, and he landed face down in the garden. And to an absolutely quiet crowd, he said to this young man, these are good people. Don't come around here and ever do anything like that again. And for some reason, we never had another problem. <laughs> but I often think of the scripture that says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies 
to be at peace with him. And I just thank the Lord for Dan. I'm sorry that we didn't spend a lot of time together. He was serving the Lord in one area of the world, an area of the vineyard, and I was serving in another area. But we just thank the Lord for people like this, for his dear wife, and pray for her as she is recovering, as she is seeking comfort from the Lord through these circumstances, and as his two children. Um, we, we just are so grateful that we can say with absolute assurance, Dan Bigger today is far better to be with Christ, which is far better.